Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call to order the Mayor Commission work session of January 19th, 2021, and the time is 10 a.m. Let's dive right into the agenda. First item is introduction to public works and proposed ordinance changes. Uh, Mr. McDermott. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, Josh McDermott, Director of Public Works. I have with me today uh, Erica Lighting. She's our office administrator in the back. Amy Marks. She's our Public Works Superintendent. And Matt Hajazi, our Industrial Engineer. Uh, I want to thank Matt for putting this presentation together. And also Leon Pinder in the back. He's our, many may know him already, he's our Sanitation Superintendent. So we'll go over a quick overview of our department and then we'll discuss and propose changes to our city waste, uh, city ordinance, um, chapter 74, solid waste. So public works consists of three divisions. We have sanitation and they have residential, commercial, bulk and yard, and we also have solid waste code enforcement in, them, in our uh, sanitation division as well. Uh, street maintenance consists of asphalt. We have an asphalt team, a concrete team, uh, street lighting team and also traffic operations and I'll go into more detail on those two divisions in a minute administration consists of administrative support we have an industrial engineer in our uh, administrative division as well fleet coordination we have our own customer service and our own dispatch as well so this is sanitation overview. This is a picture of one of our residential vehicles tipping a garbage can. So we have a total staff of 18 employees in sanitation. That includes one supervisor with just over or close to 24,000 customers in residential. In commercial, here's a picture of our, one of our commercial vehicles tipping a dumpster. We have a total staff of 19. That includes two supervisors with approximately 2,400 customers. And this is our Balkan yard. This is one of our grapple trucks and we service. We have a total staff of 11 employees, including one supervisor, and we service approximately 115,000 customers. And here's a picture of uh, illegal dumping. We have our own sanitation code enforcement. We have a total of three staff. That's one supervisor and two code enforcement officers. The supervisor and one of the code enforcement officers are funded by the CRA and they're responsible for all of the city. They also, uh, the two that are funded by CRA, they mostly concentrate on the CRA areas. However, the third code enforcement officer, he's, he uh, does citywide as well. Street maintenance overview. This is one of our uh, asphalt team members fixing a pothole. So we have a total staff of six employees. We're responsible for over 510 lane miles. So in addition to fixing potholes, we also do uh, small asphalt restorations and uh, repairs as well. And this is our concrete team. There's six employees on our concrete team including a supervisor. They maintain sidewalks and paver bricks. They work together with the asphalt team on doing some of the pavers. Uh, here they're restoring or replacing a traffic control device on one of our city streets. And we have street lighting. Street lighting consists of three employees. That's one supervisor and two street lighting technicians. We, uh, we're, op we're responsible for the operation and maintenance of close to 12,000 street lights citywide. That includes some FDOT and county street lights, depending on if we have a maintenance agreement with them or not. And we also do striping. Let me back up a second. We also do striping and sign maintenance. We have a uh, printer in our sign shop. 
Um, it's a total staff of five employees, including a supervisor. We maintain just over 19,000 street signs citywide. And we also do support for uh, special events. Here, here we're doing an elevator wrap, so we, we fabricate those in-house and wrap them in-house, so we support uh, a lot of the special events in that manner. We also do, uh, for our traffic di division and streets division, we, we do a lot of the uh, MOTs or the tra temporary traffic control for some of the special events, and we also support public utilities. Another key function of public works is debris management post hurricane and storm events. Our operation team coordinates with parks and rec to clear the debris for emergency and utility personnel. And we're also responsible for the debris removal. While our administrative team is responsible for tracking the expenses, maintaining the documentation, uh, financial and bookkeeping keeping activities, we also coordinate with the communications team to create and update press releases. So we actually, uh, we're, we're meeting in a few weeks to begin planning and preparations for the hurricane season, which is right around the corner. So we're gonna talk about the court current ordinance issues. I'm gonna pass it off to Matt Hajazi for this section. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Matt Hajazi, Public Works Industrial Engineer. Uh, just a, a quick overview of the current issues that we identified with the city ordinance. And um, these five items on the list uh, captures the current issues. First one being um, a special collection pickup fee. Next, commercial customers uh, affected by that uh, change and also bulk goods and has waste uh, along with landscape contractor waste. Next, I'm gonna get into more detail uh, covering each of those items. Uh, thanks. Uh, regarding um, the special collection pickup fee, uh, the current language uh, does not provide the breakdown uh, related to the cost of service. And uh, as a result of that, customers may uh, underestimate the fee associated with the service. Uh, that uh, basically uh, lack of um, uh, detail in the current language uh, could lead to uh, that misunderstanding for the overall cost. Next is commercial customers. Um, basically, as you can see, the first portion uh, covers the maximum size uh, dumpster serviced by the city. Uh, currently, uh, in, in the city ordinance does not cover that maximum size that we could cover, um, which could lead to potential uh, revenue that we could be collecting. Next is um, minimum container requirement, which is a 96 gallon city issue that doesn't really, uh, uh, is not really covered in the ordinance. And as a result of that, um, just the uh, potential issue that we see is uh, the, the image on the bottom of that slide covers a variety of different cans that uh, we could see, and some may not be compatible with our trucks. Next, uh, regarding bulk goods, uh, the current language uh, is not clear uh, in terms of uh, uh, the, the maximum number of uh, bulk goods that they could have, uh, and uh, the current language uh, basically has a, a, a volume mentioned for the bulk goods, which is typically bulk and yard are quantified with the maximum quantity, not the volume, because the volume basically is for the vegetation. Next is the hazardous waste. Um, uh, proper disposal uh, in the current language is not provided for the residents. And uh, uh, obviously, the potential risk of contamination as a result of those uh, uh, improper way of uh, disposing of those is the result of uh, uh, this potential issue. And the last problem is uh, related to the landscape contractor waste. Um, as you could see in those images, um, this basically 
uh, or actual images captured by our code enforcement officers and landscapers. Um, uh, removal of waste from the premise that they do the work is not currently uh, specified in a way that the proper way of disposing it. And uh, it could result in residents uh, getting ci citation for the landscape waste that's left by the curbside or right away because clearly um, this is an area that uh, we found uh, room for improvement and um, through these five changes. I just wanted to add, if you want to follow along, we do have this handout that we gave you all. So it's, um, it shows each issue, the current language and the proposed language. So the, the proposed language is in red and underlined. And this is going through the ACM process, so it'll be on the agenda for next Monday. Correct. Thank you. So next, um, I'm going to cover the proposed changes for these five issues that I just covered. Regarding the special uh, collection pickup fee, um, provide a breakdown of the total fee to cover the fixed fee and the variable fee, which is the trip fee and the landfill fee. Um, and this will give the residents a clear idea how this overall uh, cost for the service is calculated. Um, regarding the cost commercial customers, the revised maximum dumpster size uh, for which we provide the service uh, change from eight to 10 cubic yard. That could potentially give us the revenue that uh, we could collect for providing that service. And also regarding the uh, 96 gallon can uh, to be issued by the city to ensure that we have consistency and uh, most importantly, uh, compatibility with our trucks, with the side loader trucks. Next, regarding the bulk goods, um, the, we're revising the current language to define a specific quantity of bulk goods. As I mentioned, bulk goods has nothing to do with the volume. Next is the hazardous waste. Um, we added a section regarding the hazardous waste disposal and remind the residents of local and state law requirements. And the last one regarding the landscape contractor waste uh, uh, through the proposed change, we clarify the landscape contractor shall, not, shall remove the waste by hauling to approved facility rather than leaving it on the right of way or curbside after finishing the work. So with that being said, um, if you have any questions, that Thank wraps you. up the changes. Um, let me make an observation while we have the opportunity. Um, when COVID hit, uh, one of the things that, that I have bragged about uh, is how departments pulled together to continue to provide services to our residents. Your department is one that can't really do remote working, right? You can't fix a pothole remotely. You can't pick up garbage remotely. Mm -hmm. So let me just thank you publicly uh, for all that you've done, your team has done to continue to provide our citizens with the service that they have grown accustomed to, even in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, and again, you didn't have the opportunity of sending 40, 50 percent of your staff to do this work from home. Uh, you all remain on the front line. Uh, you continue to provide the services that the, and, and our citizens continue to receive the benefit of all your services. So let me just publicly thank you, uh, Josh and your team, uh, for, for you all doing what you had to do uh, to provide the level of service to our community to which they have grown accustomed. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. A um, couple of questions. So when you talk about the fees uh, and you're trying to make it clear, uh, particularly in the definitions, is there a fee schedule somewhere that the public can uh, look at? Is it on a website or something so they could uh, not yes. only see the actual fee and not just the category? There's a fee schedule that's posted on our website. Okay. No fees are changing. We're just making it more clear to the resident what they pay for. So we're not changing any fees at all. Okay, very good. Um, commissioner's questions, yeah, Madam President. 
Thank you, Merritt, and thank you very much for the presentation. Um, really, I just have a comment, and I wanted to say thank you, uh, Josh, to your team, um, Mitch Posner and his team, and Jose Tegel for engaging residents in some changes that would directly affect them. So I really appreciate the neighborhood engagement. I know we have another one to do, but I was completely appreciative. I know the neighbors understood um, kind of the changes and how they would affect them and what could have been a, a very big misconception turned into a very positive situation. So just wanted to say thank you very much to your team for reaching out and doing that. And thank you for your support with that. We appreciate that. Uh, other questions? Yeah, Commissioner Fox. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, this presentation. I had a question um, regarding illegal dumping, and I don't know if that falls under the, the category of bulk goods, but uh, last week I was taking a walk with Rafael Clemente from the DDA through the downtown, and we were just looking at some of the areas that were having, especially having issues um, with trash and things like that. And we walked through the alleys um, behind some of the restaurants, and he said that it, it was a, in particular an issue that many, um, with the dumpsters in the back, that there were a lot of people were Ill doing illegal dumping there, uh, and that there was some remedy that you had in mind about maybe putting codes or something on those garbage cans in the back so that only the people that actually were you know, in that restaurant that needed those could be using, utilizing those. And I just, I, I wasn't clear if that's exactly what it was, but if there's anything else that we can look at for solutions in other parts of the city, I know that many of us had a call from um, the owner of Roosters that um, it was, you know, a bar that had is had a fire last year, and so now they're not, you know, there all the time, and they have had a lot of issues with illegal dumping while they're not open. And so I was just curious if there's anything else that we can look at for those situations. Like I see the bulk goods here, and I trying to determine, you know, how do you know whether it's illegal dumping or somebody that lives there that's actually putting this out. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Definitely. So let me address the uh, downtown area real quick. Uh, you may be referring to Rocco's Tacos. Right now there's, uh, there's four dumpsters down there. We're going to replace those with a compactor. We're actually working with uh, Sibile on that. We want to wrap them and make them look a little bit better because the alleyway just west of there has been uh, reconstructed and they want to activate the alley eventually. So we're looking at wrapping those three compactors in that area. There's two in the uh, 300 block and one that we're going to place in the 200 block. With these new compactors, we're able to provide each user or each customer with their own access code. So nobody will be able to use that compactor except for the person who's actually paying for it. Uh, we think that will help with some of the illegal, dump illegal dumping. And right now, uh, the size of the dumpsters and the, the quantity that we have out there is just not enough. So I think with the compactor, that's going to help with some of it. We have one supervisor, uh, as I mentioned, he's funded by the CRA, so he concentrates in the downtown area and then uh, Northwood. So um, Leon's listening will definitely make sure that he looks into some additional and uh, solutions. We, we meet monthly with the Clean Streets Task Force, so we'll certainly add that to the agenda. Um, as far as roosters go, I know Leon visited that area. Unfortunately, when you do illegal dumping, um, if it happens on your property, the property owner is responsible for that. That's, you know, that's what our, our ordinance states. Um, but we can work with the, the property owner. Um, you know, they don't always necessarily receive a citation right away. We do work with them. So I, uh, I'm not sure exactly what we did with roosters. Uh, maybe Leon can touch on that, but I did. I saw the post on Engage, and, and uh, Armando and I talked about it a little bit, so we did go down there. So again, we have our own sanitation code enforcement, so all sanitation code enforcement um, concerns should, should come through us, so we could address those. But we do work with the customers. Uh, we look at other options, you know, cameras. We're looking at deploying nine cameras citywide, not just in the CRA areas, uh, so we're looking at that. We spoke recently to Raphael with the DDA. Um, about purchasing some additional cameras for the downtown area. So we're looking at everything we can. We realize it's an issue and, and uh, we again, we meet monthly to discuss it with the Clean Street Task Force. Uh, Commissioner Lambert. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Josh, uh, to you and your team for the presentation and for the work that you continuously do. And I'm glad Commissioner Fox brought up um, roosters because that was one of my questions as well is, um, you know, just, 
clearly we want to penalize the bad actors for the legal dumping and just wondering if there was anything that could be done as in for the business owners of the people who are victims of the illegal dumping. And, and now I have spoken with the owner there and he is going to be putting up a fence to help deter that in the future. But, you know, um, I live in a neighborhood that's somewhat close to the railroad tracks. And for some reason, people feel like coming into neighborhoods that are close to the railroad tracks that that means that they can drop things off there illegally and you know a lot of times see mattresses and things like that we call the city and you're very responsive in picking them up thank you i was just curious if um i know that i saw the press release recently about the fines that um if we are able to catch people who are doing illegal dumping do we have any signage speaking to that in the areas we know that are repeat offense locations we don't have any signage that states that a reward could be offered if, if a conviction is made. Uh, that was something newer that we've done. It's been, it was implemented about nine months ago or so, but there, there is a reward if, if the person is caught uh, on video and convicted, there's a $100 reward possible. Um, so we don't have any signage that shows that, but we do have signage specifically for illegal dumping that we can put up in certain areas. We get it through the Solid Waste Authority, um, our sign shop actually, uh, through um, our sanitation division, our sign shop can put the signage up. So if you if, if there are some um, specific locations, we can put some signage up. I think that would be helpful and or door hangers on the homes that are near the areas where this happens often because it is primarily not the people who live in that area that this is happening to. Um, and also it's it's our communities that maybe don't speak English as their primary language. So if we could have them translated and to Spanish, that would be helpful as well. well. We'll put that on our agenda for our clean street meeting. Uh, and we, we also do some outreach to the uh, public as well, and we have a, one of our code enforcement officers does speak Spanish, so we could look at doing some uh, more public outreach. Thank you. Mayor, Commissioner, I'm just going to address really quick the, the legal dumping issues. As, as Josh mentioned, we have the Operation Clean Streets team, and that, so that includes uh, law enforcement on there. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a discussion very soon about prosecuting some of these cases because it's one thing it's one thing to try to enforce it. It's another thing and then take that through the next step to prosecution and a, a robust uh, public relations campaign on anti littering. So we've really beefed up Operation Clean Streets over the last two months right before the holidays. So you're going to see a lot of movement on there over the next few months. And we'll be updating you as we get, come up with some new uh, strategies and new initiatives under that. That's great. And, you know, I love to hear the public relations campaign because the other thing I was thinking is, you know, it's expensive if you have a lot of waste and you have to, you know, get rid of it in the proper manner. And so I hope in our public relations campaign, we're also utilizing the resources of our sustainability department because I think they partner with Resource Depot, with other organizations that allow people to recycle at no cost. Yes, yeah, sustainability is on it. And we actually have two citizens who, are, who have been heavily engaged in the past in, uh, in litter campaigns, anti-litter campaigns, who are part of this committee. And they presented to us and we had a really good discussion on that. So you'll be seeing a campaign very soon. Okay, and Mayor, I have another question. Yes. Thank you. I had a question, and, and first of all, I want to say thank you so much for putting the slide numbers on. It's actually regarding slide number 10. Um, and you mentioned the different sizes of the trash cans. I was just curious, what percentage, I don't know if you know exactly, but just generally, do we know of commercial or residential that are using the incorrect sizes, and how will this affect them? So the, the dumpster right now, the, the way the ordinance language reads, we I'm going to address the, the commercial one first, the dumpster. So right, right now it reads that we can provide up to eight cubic yards. Um, our trucks can service up to 10 cubic yards, so we're losing some business. We don't know my, how much business we're losing, but we, with the increase, with changing that discrepancy, we'll potentially get more revenue in. So I don't, I don't have the percentage. As far as the 96-gallon uh, container goes, right now, you can see in the illustration right here, there are several different types of cans that commercial establishments may be using. Uh, we, we don't have that percentage either. However, what we're going to do is, just like we're doing with Northwood, is we're going to issue the city, uh, or it'll be a city-issued 96-gallon container. So not only is it safer and more efficient for the customers, but it's also the same for our, for our employees that are tipping the can. 
And it'll be no cost to them to be no issued cost to the city container. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Paduzzi. Thank you, Mayor. If I could briefly um, turn back to littering that we talked about just a couple minutes ago. Um, I had the opportunity this weekend, I was driving, uh, excuse me, riding my bikes or bikes with my kids down um, North Lake Boulevard on the bike path from Ibis to uh, Beeline. And I guess you do notice a lot more when you're on a bike or walking, but I noticed there was a lot of litter on the fence line. I mean, it was just plastered actually. I, I was shocked at how much was, was there. And the question I have is, do we have dedicated staff to um, you know, picking up litter uh, in the public works department? Or is that something that, that I should just, you know, with the regard to that particular stretch, should I be organizing something with the community? That stretch, I'm almost positive, is maintained through a contract and the contract is administered or uh, we have Parks and Rec, Todd Snyder, he, I, I'm almost positive that he maintains the contract for that stretch of roadway. But I can check in with him just to make sure, but we do not have dedicated staff to go out and pick up litter. There are certain locations that are uh, maintained through a contract, and I'm almost positive that Todd Snyder does the one for that particular stretch. Yeah, uh, th that, that is right. And uh, I think we have an independent contractor also taking care of Okeechobee through Parks and Recs. Madam uh, City Administrator, can you have um, uh, Leah or whoever is in charge of that uh, talk with the commissioner? And, uh, you know, he can identify specifically where some of that is. Uh, since I was commissioner out in District 4, North, you know, garbage on North Lake was a continuous issue and continuous complaint. So if we aren't addressing that, we need to be. And as I said, I think we're paying a contractor to deal with that. So let's follow up, please. Follow up. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one particular area of concern, because I was thinking I could organize something, but a lot of it was actually beyond the fence line. There was tires coolers i mean there was just i couldn't believe the amount of stuff and you don't see it from the road from the road it actually looks clean because there's kind of like a little ditch right at the fence line and it's all accumulated in there and a lot of it is actually in the water actually inside grassy waters it's you know gotten through the fence so i think it might be a little problematic even getting to some of it but i'm sure there's there's got to be a way but there's some large things that have somehow made their way over that fence so I just wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Thank you. We could talk to public utilities about that inside the fence line. Uh, Madam President. Thank you, Mayor. And, you know, some of my colleagues bring up litter and illegal dumping, which are issues that affect the North End in particular. You know, we have some contracted areas, the Broadway corridor, that staff has been really, really helpful in getting some additional garbage cans. I know um, the public has reached out to see how they can inquire about getting garbage cans in other areas, the Palm Beach Lakes corridor, the 45th Street corridor, as well as increased um, regulation on illegal dumping. It affects the Pleasant City neighborhood, the Coleman Park neighborhood in particular. And thanks to Mayor and his leadership for the Clean Streets Task Force team. Could you talk a little bit about if there is some ways that residents can report in? What's the best way, if I have illegal dumping on my street, to report into um, sanitation and public works to have that addressed. Understanding we're, we're trying to prevent it at the source, but if it does happen, how can we best address it quickly? You can report it online through our website. I don't have the link. Matt can uh, step up in a second ago. He, he might have the link memorized, but you can report it. Uh, we're also working with Kathleen. I think it's Clean Streets. Uh, I'm not going to... Uh, yes, the URL to report it on our website is wpb.org forward slash clean streets. And the advantage of reporting it that way is they could upload images, and as soon as that's uh, submitted, it's gonna issue a, a service request in our dashboard, in our work order system. Great, so if you know the commissioner's on her walk or you know, any of the commissioners on bike rides, et cetera, throughout the city, we could just log onto that app and report it as we see it. Absolutely. Perfect, thank you. And to address litter, we're also looking at other uh, methods and means through our Clean Street Task Force. So like Armando mentioned, we have two citizens uh, on the task force and they had some really great ideas. Any other, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mr. No, I, I just want to point out since we're, you know, we are speaking to the public, it's, none of this can be done without the public's cooperation. You heard, you heard the amount of staff that these folks have. It is very limited. Uh, they are stretched to the bone. So, 
really need, that's why the campaign is so important. Folks need to take responsibility and be part of the solution because otherwise there's just no way resource wise that we could respond to every single trash that's being thrown in the streets. We need the citizens to step up as well. Yeah, it adds new meaning to the term, see something, say something. Um, it's not just about uh, physical um, interaction, but yeah, I anything affecting the quality of life. Mayor, can I mention one more thing? Absolutely. So it may not be a commission workshop. Uh, uh, we're working with engineering department on a solution to this. We identified some areas that are congested throughout the city and it's difficult for us to pick up trash especially yard and bulk waste. So we've had that, uh, we identified some areas, Flamingo, Flamingo Park and some other locations throughout the city. So we're working with Kevin and his team on how we're gonna address and fix those uh, concerns we have. So I don't, I'm not sure if it's gonna be a mayor commission workshop. I'm sure it probably will be at some point, but it's something that we're working on. Yes, and I appreciate that. I was in a meeting with, with staff and, and they are to look at the city as a whole so we could come up with citywide yes, sir. Uh, solutions and, and resolutions to address it. But thank you. Uh, yes, Commissioner. Thank you. There's been a lot of talk about the clean streets and the public relations campaign against anti-littering. Will we have a presentation or more in-depth information on all of that effort going towards anti-littering? I could. One, one thing where we meet in a, in a couple of weeks, one of the things that we're looking at is becoming an affiliate of Keep America Beautiful. Um, Palm Beach County, there's a few municipalities down south and north of us that are affiliates. So let us get, gather some more information and I'll work with Armando on, on, on the presentation. Okay. And, you know, idea. it's not lost on me that it's, it takes a number of different strategies to solve this. We spoke recently, um, there was some overflowing trash cans at a business nearby that the wind was taking that trash actually across Dixie and into a neighborhood that they could see the address of the business that was streets away. And so that was one area by, you know, one way to fix that by getting them the trash cans that were the right size or, you know, helping them to understand not to overflow their trash cans. You know, but but the other issue that you brought up is 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 the public. and. You know, yesterday with Martin Luther King Day and all of the service activities that were going on, I drove down by Curry Park and that property that's vacant across the street. I know that many of us actually helped, I think all of us on the dais here, helped clean that up just about a month or two ago, and it was riddled with litter again. And, you know, I do see trash cans out there, and, and you know, I know that we're aware of that, um, but, it, but it really is the public being aware as well. I remember when we were picking up trash there, a woman came out of the apartment complex there and said, thank you so much for doing this. She said, I actually saw one of my neighbors pull up in his car, throw something out the window, and then pull into the garage. Mm -hmm. and, and she, you know, was up in her, on her balcony, and she was yelling at him, you know, stop doing that. And so if there's more that we can do to help encourage residents to you know, um, be kind <laughs> to, to our earth and, and to each other. That's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else on this item? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Josh and your thank team you. for a, a wonderful presentation. We appreciate discussion. it. Okay, next item, uh, fire assessment quarterly update. Uh, Commissioner Fox, any introductory comments you want to make before we get into the presentation from Chief Matty? Thank you. I, I just think during the budget process last year, I was new and trying to figure out, you know, all the, the objectives for why we had raised the fire assessment fee. And I went back to the original vote, watching it online. And, you know, there was talk about having quarterly updates so that we could kind of assess where we are and make sure that we're on the right, right track, keeping, you know, being responsible um, to the residents. And so thank you for allowing us to have this today and hoping to get a little bit more clarity also about you know, the, the things that we can use these funds for. So thank you. Very good, thank you. Chief Maddie. Okay, good morning. I'm Diana Maddie, Fire Chief. I have with me uh, Linda McDermott from the Budget Office, uh, Chief Guy Matante, who is, um, his area of responsibility includes the 131, and we have Kevin Volbrick from Engineering who can answer our questions, any questions you may have at the end. Just a little bit of a background on what the fire assessment fee is. It's a special revenue assessment um, for the purpose of funding operational improvements or rep replacing fire equipment and facilities. So ideally, 
uh, fire trucks, fire stations. The, one of the benefits of the fire assessment fee is there's a reduction in the cost of fire insurance when you have a higher um, IS or excuse me a lower ISO rating. It's, it's one is the highest. We're a two X, so the higher we the lower we get in that number, the better benefit it is for the businesses and the residents of the city. This is the ordinance that was enacted. This goes back to 2008 when it was first um, created and implemented. It's a very lengthy uh, document. It might be hard to see on the screen. So this is uh, just what the current rates are. You have, it's $100 per dwelling unit. You may have some places with a, a mother-in-law or a cottage that rents, um, rent it out or, or have uh, different like uh, um, cottages on their property and that would be per dwelling unit. So some may pay two or three depending on if they're cropped up into apartments. And then the rest of it, it's, it's a tiered uh, fee schedule based on square footage. So, so with the adopted uh, revenues from, from 2020, we actually received 7.7 .7 million and in 2021, uh, we're looking at 7.7 .7 million uh, coming in for this year. So we don't have that numbers actually yet. So in 2020, this is just, uh, uh, if you look at the top, the fire assessment fee was 6.9 million. The actuals came in at 7.7. .7. And we, we do pretty well with the delinquent fire assessment fees. We have a company called GSG Government Services Group that administers the bills, the, the assessment, um, and, and part of the collection. So we're only at a, a very minimal number, $8,500 in delinquent fees. So we're, we're very proud of that too. Uh, and, then, and then you can see kind of closer down the bottom, some of the bigger expenses were finishing off payments for fire stations four and eight and some apparatus. There's a lot of transfers in here that are um, kind of between fleet and, and finance that, that Linda McDermott can answer the, the particular nuances on. So, and then here's 2021. So you can see we've, we're carrying still around that 8,500 so far and then 7.7 um, .7 coming in. There was some money that was carried forward and you'll see in some transfers down here, which were things like lease payments uh, that had to go towards lease payments on fire trucks, um, interest on those lease payments, etc. So this is just a, a kind of an overview of our fire stations. Uh, Station 9 is unique in that we put it into service in a, in a previously kind of underserved area that had bad, uh, poor response times. So we put that into service in a strip mall on January 1st, 2016. So we're coming into our uh, fifth year of Fire Station 9. So they were in a strip mall. Now they're in an apartment building up kind of near um, Morse Life. So those are the neighborhoods they service. And then you can see the ages of the fire stations eight four and five have been built since the fire assessment fee was enacted so some of our the older buildings are below that um one's out of order but going back to station six that's 1985 that fire station was built for one fire truck and none very little of those developments that are out there there was sandalwood and they were building some of the other uh ones off saratoga there was very little out there uh and so that station it should be on our you know radar down the line to expand or replace and then fire station one which was built in 1980 uh, again was built for a different population a different number of firefighters and a far different call volume the capital projects that are in this budget are very few we've got about seventy five thousand dollars for fire station one window and door repair some of those doors and windows have been there for 40 years and and they, they show their age. There's um, fire station roofs for, for seven and two, and then uh, exhaust ventilation system for um, the fire stations, which we, we're actually mounting them on the vehicles now versus how things used to be. Um, they would have fans or they would have something that hooks up to the truck. Now they're directly mounted on the fire truck so that 
not only are we protected when it's starting up and, and driving in in the fire stations, but when we're working out on calls, you know, if you're standing between two fire trucks, you've got better protection uh, from the carcinogens. And then a small amount for uh, carry forward from fire station eight funds. So our future needs, you know, we have, we have fire station nine temporary. Currently, uh, we moved the trailer from where fire station four was housed off of Haverhill and, and Roebuck area. There's a, there's a plot of land that they've been paving and putting water and utilities and, and getting that ready. So we're maybe a month or two out from moving into the trailer. But remember, that's still a temporary building. That's still something that has to be evacuated during a hurricane. Those crews will have to be lo relocated. Then fire station nine permanent, so a brick and mortar building on that site that can accommodate the growth of the fire department. Uh, as they build out there, the call volume is going to increase when those when the woods goes away to the south of Roebuck. That's going to be apartments or condos or whatever, and and we're going to need to be we're going to need to have the space to plan for the future. We still need the training facility, fire station one, which was built again in 1980, needs to be replaced or re, a, a dramatic remodel, and the same with station six. And we have a we're we're going to have a continual um, need to purchase or lease fire trucks that's never going to change and that maintenance of those fire trucks and fire stations is never going to change we currently have the industry standard we follow the industry standard for replacing our fire trucks and that's on a 10-year cycle where our rescue trucks are on a five-year that's the smaller ones that take people to the hospital that doesn't those trucks those five-year trucks don't come out of fire assessment fee because they're medical related so with those, uh, with the purchase of those fire trucks, you know we're always trying to trying to keep up with uh, the most modern um, technologies that are available. Safety for the firefighters with with um, their black boxes in them now, and they have um, the seat belts. We get the seat belts colored red so that we can see from a distance that the people are wearing their seat belts. So we always want to keep up with those industry standards. And uh, so you know we're still making up for about a five-year period where we didn't buy any rigs. So we're kind of climbing out of that hole. We have four engines that are coming that, are, that have been ordered that are on the, finishing up on the production line we should have later the, in the spring. And a ladder truck, another ladder truck that's about a year and change out. So, um, so we'll leave it for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Chief, and thank you for that report. Um, I'm gonna sit down uh, with you and the city administrator because I'd like to see a different format for this uh, more simpler, uh, basically showing what we had at the beginning of the year, uh, what was deducted, what we collected, what was deducted, and what we had at the end of the year. And, and maybe with, the, with respect to the expenses, we could have categories, uh, whether it's capital, personnel, et cetera. So it could be pretty clear. And then I'd also like to see a comparison from year to year. Mm -hmm. You know, what, what, what we brought in in 2019 versus 2020 so we could see those uh, side by side, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that. I, I think an additional question was, and, and it may come up, is what can we use legally, what can we use uh, the uh, proceeds for? From so in this slide, number three, it outlines what the, what the, the, uh, the fee is allowed to be used for. Fuel, parts, supplies, maintenance, repairs, utilities, et cetera. Um, land, so if we needed to buy land for a fire station, salaries. Um, like I said, we use it for fuel, for our, our bunker gear, helmets, boots, gloves, anything that has to do with the actual fire portion of what we do. So it can't be used for the rescues, can't be used for medical supplies, um, bandages, any, anything like that. Okay. Uh, questions, uh, commissioners? Madam President. Then. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks, Chief Maddie, for your presentation. When you were showing um, some of the uh, fee that had been collected, we showed year over year, so um, 2020 versus 2021. When you do your planning um, for the entire fire department, do you also include, when we do a capital plan, we do a five-year plan as well. Does the fire department have a, a five-year plan or a 10-year plan or some uh, um, projection? We, we do not, but I, I think it's an important thing that we um, that we would establish because it's it's really it's about vision it's about 
you know, we've moved personnel over into the fire assessment fee. We've got about 57% of the fire assessment fee is personnel. So if we were to, you know, have, have, a, have, have input from the mayor, from commissioners, from engineering, fire, and fleet, and we also have a, um, you know, pay, pay over a million dollars in IT for internal service funds. So we, we all need to, we would have to get together to determine with the input of the public, what's most important, paying uh, salaries out of the fire assessment fee or, or moving those back out to where they, they used to live in general fund and, um, and put maybe a savings plan away for fire station nine or, you know, and have, whatever we decided as a, as a collective, let's say 10% a year for infrastructure. You know, we, no, that's a, that's a good idea. Thank you, and, and Mayor, if I may, um, I think that that's important for us to understand strategically as we go forward. Um, and even from a public input perspective, we hear a lot about you know, input from the public of where um, we wanna spend our fire assessment dollars and to have that strategic um, plan down the road, especially given that we're talking about some, some very expensive equipment, very necessary equipment and buildings that we could start to say, there's a visioning and, and here is where things are going down the road. So I offer that up as a suggestion. No, I think that's a great idea. Uh, Commissioner Fox. And then Commissioner. Thank you so much for this presentation. I, I wanted to just go back to, if you don't mind, the, just a question about why we um, decided to raise the fire assessment fee and were there objectives that, I mean, were there things that we needed additional money for? Or like when you just mentioned that 50% of the salaries have been moved from the general fund. Is this additional money that we're being spent on the fire department or is the money, is the spot that used to be in the general fund gone for, to something else? Or I'm just trying to get a sense of, um, you know, why it was, why we needed to raise this money and is it, I mean, additional money to go to resources for the fire department or just to clear up other spots in the general fund? What I can speak to is, is what happened when, when we were in the budget process and we were asked to, to move general fund items over into fire assessment fee. And we looked at our budget and said, you know, these things are 100% fire and we can move these over. As far as what happened in the general fund and, and where those fund, excuse me, where that money went um, to that, I guess um, Linda McDermott could, could speak to that. Now, in addition to Ms. McDermott, I also would like to add some footnotes, but go right ahead. Oh, good morning. Linda McDermott, budget manager. Yes, just so a little bit of the history of the reason why we increased the fire assessment fee fund, we needed fire trucks. Our old ones, the uh, maintenance fees were getting higher and higher. So the old fire assessment fee at one point, we had a lot of maintenance. We were going over on expenses. So not only looking towards fire station nine, the needs of the fire trucks, the current fire station repairs, roofs, stoves, and everything we're getting, they all needed to be done. So a lot of the money was also for the principal and interest for the leases of previous fire trucks, new fire trucks, and stations. There are two stations. So in enhancing the fire assessment fee, it's a special revenue fund. It ensures that even if we have a little bit of leftover money or we have to make a change, it stays for your fire services. And that's the benefit of having it as an assessment fee. Um, it allows you, the public, the commission, and administration to identify those things specific to fire. So we took on in this year nine new firefighters. We have a, a new truck that went out there, and those nine firefighters are for that truck. When you add a station, and the previous general fund was not enough to uh, provide for a new station, this is going back a few years, that's where the importance of this fire assessment fee fund is. Gets you that fire truck for that station. Gets you the extra firefighters to make sure that we can man and keep up with your calls for service, uh, the excellent um, insurance ratings like Diana said. 
when you identify a special fund, your insurance rating knows that you cannot use those excess to balance the general fund. And that's, uh, that's why it's a special fund. So all of these things, we get together, just so you know how we develop the budget. The budget office looks at all the debt services first, our principal and interest that's required. Those maintenance items on the things that were previously bought with fire assessment fee and the station needs. We get together with the fire department, we sit there, we do the line item budget of all the absolute funding that we need. Everything in excess, we review with Kevin, and those are the things that commission administration say uh, the interests are in, whether it be for the police and fire training, uh, additional items that may be needed, whether it be a new stove, which could be $100,000, things like that, just so you know how we create this. And I hope that answered a lot of your questions. Is there a follow-up? Thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify one thing that you, I think, mainly mentioned that we needed more fire trucks and more um, thing like resources. But what I heard Chief Maddie say was that 50% or more of the, the personnel was also moved to that um, fire assessment fee. And you are mentioning more talking about the items than just trucks. So I guess I'm just still trying to clarify you know, where, what's happened in the general fund, the, those items that used to be paid for in the general fund, what are, what's being paid for by the general fund at this point? Well, the general fund, um, for several years, we did not fund for the fire trucks. We did have to go out and get a loan for the stations and trucks. So that's where this fire assessment fee helped us. So it's not that it took away. Now, the nine new firefighters, yes, that would have had to be um, within the general fund, had this uh, funding source not been available. Commissioner, I um, um, almost gave you a demotion again, I'm sorry. Madam City Administrator, you wanted to weigh in on this. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And while you say you, teasingly it'll be a demotion, I think it'll be adding some honor to my title, but I, I, I appreciate <laughs> that. I wanna just put my comments into context, You know, given that I'm one year uh, out of the gate here with the city's uh, budget, but there are some important points uh, that I think uh, will help with this uh, discussion. So as we look at the fire assessment fee fund, you know, being the new city administrator, I have spent uh, a significant amount of time delving into the fund and how it's structured and have had several uh, work sessions with both the budget staff as well as uh, Chief Matty. Uh, and uh, to kind of get an understanding from a vision standpoint and policy standpoint, you know, how we are budgeting the fire assessment fee revenue and what, if anything, we can do differently. And so to the point of strategically coming up with a plan, that is an ongoing conversation uh, that Chief Maddie and I are engaged in. The challenge, and I don't mean to go back and litigate our budget process because we have a challenging one ahead of us, uh, but it uh, needs to always be kept on the forefront. The challenge that we have right now with changing how we are budgeting the fire assessment uh, revenue is that we are still in the midst of a major fiscal challenge as it relates to the general fund. Those two funds kind of work uh, hand in hand to the extent that costs or expenses that are eligible to be funded out of the general fund, but because of the financial constraints, we are not able to have them in the general fund and they were shifted because they are eligible to be funded out of the fire assessment fund, it relieved the burden on the general fund. Relieving the burden on the general fund then allows us to have balanced the general fund. It doesn't take that money that if we had 
put it in the general fund, it's then put in abeyance and it's sitting somewhere to be used for something else. So that was how we balance. And I'll give you a, what I consider to be a perfect example. When we look at the nine firefighters that were shifted into the fire assessment fund, two years ago, prior to my appointment, when I believe the fire assessment uh, fee was increased to what it is now, the fire chief, on the premise that we were going to have nine firefighters put into the budget, pull another engine into service. Those nine firefighters, which would have come into FY20 budget, were not budgeted. So that left the city in a position where the chief operationally pulled that engine back into service, had to then staff it with overtime. That overtime was not budgeted. So that caused the fire department's budget to, overtime budget to significantly exceed what was in the budget. So now we're looking at reserves money to make up that gap. When the chief and I sat down and did an analysis on what it will cost us to fund the nine firefighters compared to what we were paying in overtime, which exceeded the overtime budget, this is above and beyond, uh, it's slightly less with the nine firefighters being funded in the budget. However, we didn't have the money in the general fund. So therein it was funded, it was shifted to be funded out of the fire assessment fund. Shifting eligible costs from a general fund side of the ledger to different funds where they are eligible is a uh, best practice when you're in a constrained financial situation. Another example, if the board will recall through the budget work sessions we had to relieve burden on the general fund, we shifted uh, a couple of positions out of the general fund into the gas tax because that was eligible. That helped us to balance the budget. If we didn't do the eligible, legally permissible shifts, then what it would put the board in a position and administration is you would have to cut. You simply would have to reduce expenses, you would have to do layoffs so that you then relieve that burden from the general fund. So, you know, it's various ways that you can do that. And part of the budget, the, the board's preference through this challenging budget year we had in FY20 was to minimize or no staff layoffs so we had to find a way to relieve the burden on the general fund to be able to balance without having the number of staff layoffs, which we end up having no staff layoffs, and we end up doing significant uh, cuts to uh, discretionary parts of the general fund. But again, when we do those shifts, it's not like we didn't have general fund money sitting on account where now because you didn't incur this expense for the nine firefighters, that money is sitting there waiting for the board to decide we're going to use it X, Y, and Z. That money absorb all of the expenses in your general fund budget to help us balance that $190 million in the general fund. Any uh, follow-up, Commissioner? Thank you. I Thank you for the explanation. I, I think one question I also have that I heard you mention about the reserves to pay for the overtime. Are we talking about the reserves from the general fund? Or are we talking about the reserves from the fire assessment fee? State the question again. I, well, one of the things that you just touched upon was using reserves to pay for the overtime that was incurred by the fire department. And I'm just curious which reserves are we talking about? Thank you for the clarification. That is the general fund uh, reserves. What happened in FY20? Again, going back, because we've had so much to happen in the course of one year, given that revenues were in a free fall and we were trying to stay uh, out front on them or at least keep pace with them. At mid-year during FY20, we put an across-the-board freeze in place in the, for general fund expenses. That allowed us to freeze expenses and try to build up money that was not going to be spent. In one of the work sessions that we had with the board, 
when we were looking at what we projected the shortfall was going to be because of the drop in revenues and offsetting it with the savings because we had the freeze in place on expenses, we put a freeze in place on hiring for the overtime in, uh, in the fire department's budget, and I'm gonna have the budget director to correct my memory here if I incorrectly state this. One of the ways that we looked at covering the overcheck over in overtime, the excess in overtime, was to the extent that we save uh, money from not spending and from not hiring, it was going to cover that overtime. How much of that overtime we actually covered from underspending, I don't have that dollar amount, but to the extent that we didn't, then we had to dip into the general fund reserves for overtime, not the fire assessment fee fund for reserves. And Ms. McDermott, you can correct my misstatements, okay. please. Okay, that was a very correct statement. And the amount was 1.4 million for the um, overtime for fire. Uh, we were able to cover all but about 500,000. We had to move money from other departments for savings, okay? Police departments over time was not as high as we anticipated, which was great, because otherwise we would have had to cover theirs too. So uh, as Ms. Johnson said, we were able to cover all of this because of re reductions, not only in personnel, but in operating, no travel, no training, uh, no memberships. Um, we really did, and so we were able to cover that. So the benefit of this fire assessment fee is, now this is a second year burden of the nine. We are eligible to do this, and this is the right thing to do, in my opinion, as budget. Um, we paid for station nine out of fire assessment fee funds. So nine additional firefighters and those fire trucks to go with it would also be the same complement that should come out of the fire assessment fee fund. Again, coming from budget and finances and what we're allowed to spend our money with, we have done some deep diving in this with Ms. Johnson, and I think that's why I know it by heart, because we really had a lot of meetings on it. And I just want you to know that I feel really good about this, and we work very closely with the fire department, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Lambert, you had a question? Thank you so much for that clarification and explanation, Administrator Johnson. I, I think that um, balancing our city's budget and all of the different funds that we have is, is very complicated, and I know all of the staff works very hard on this. Um, I think that, you know, a, a concern for me is just the, um, the intent of the fire assessment fee when it was passed, when it was increased. And, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that the intent was not to cover personnel expenses. That it was for capital improvements and for trucks and for Originally, the yes. Originally, yes. The uh, $25, then it was $50 fee. Yes, that was true. It was for that capital and um, the stations. But as you get a new station, like I say, you have other needs and uh, the fire trucks are getting more expensive, everything else is getting more expensive. So when we look to financing, not just with fire, but with everything else, we look at those eligible. What are we eligible to use this with? So let's do what we need to do, bring them up to snuff, give them what they need, and use the benefit of a special uh, revenue fund. Thank you. And I do recall talking about um, some staff that would be funded out of other special funds like the gas tax. Mm -hmm. Was this part of that presentation as well? Was it indicated that this number of personnel would be coming out of the fire assessment fee during the budget process? Uh, we had, I think, one work session on that. Cause it, was was, it, 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 it was, it was yeah. absolutely uh, mentioned. We, and I will be happy to provide the okay. uh, board with the presentations from the various work sessions. I can't recall the specific date of the work session because we had uh, nine or 10 different work sessions. But if I would take you back to the discussion 
in one of the work sessions, we listed out by way of a presentation in PowerPoint the different options and strategies that were utilized to balance the general fund budget. And that was indicated in there. As it relates to the fire assessment fee fund, there were two particular items that were mentioned. It was the nine firefighters being shifted over. And if you recall, it was one that had to do with, and I'm going to say, an assistant fire chief yeah. salary. And it was that $370,000 figure. And that figure came into question on whether or not we had anyone being paid at that level, but it included salary, benefits, pension, and all, which drove that number up. So I specifically remember those two items being part of the work session discussion and delineating to the board the different shifts that were made from the general fund into other funds. But I will certainly provide that PowerPoint presentation. Thank yes, you. actually, in the gas tax, six, um, six personnel were moved over from sanitation uh, to the gas tax fund, and they work on the roadways and all, and um, this, this was a very good benefit to us. We started uh, personnel in the fire assessment fee in 20. We brought over uh, three because of their facilities, new stations, um, logistics, it was a lot, so we brought three over, and then we added two for, again, the facilities, and then the nine firefighters in 21. So, you know. And let me just also uh, put another item on there that may help bring some of that discussion back when we talk about the shifts from the general fund. One of the other items that, uh, of strategies that we utilize with balancing, which we're, the, really it's this year's general fund, although we were in FY20 uh, fiscal year. If the board will recall, as part of the COPS grant, we had the approval for the 30 uh, COPS uh, to be hired. One of the strategies that we utilized was under the uh, provisions of the grant and given the likelihood of layoffs here with trying to balance the general fund budget that had a $10 million hole, we shifted the salaries for 15 of the police officers out of the general fund and rolled those into the grant. So again, another strategy to help budget your general fund budget when you are in a very constrained fiscal situation. Now, the salaries that we shifted out of the general fund and rolled into the grant we did that on the basis that at the back end of that grant period, that cost has to come back into the general fund. So we're trying to just buy some time with the hope that this pandemic will get under better control and we will see our revenues rebound and the general fund will be in a stronger position than what it has been this last year and presently is. Do you have a follow up, Commissioner? Thank you. And I guess my next question relates to at, at, at what cost, and maybe this goes to what Commissioner Schof was asking about, a strategic plan for the fire assessment fund. But so what did we decide not to do when we decided to take these salaries into the fire assessment fee? Or is um, that unknown? I'm not sure what you mean by that. At what cost? So we're spending money from the fire assessment fee on let's say this line of 1.5 million on personnel services, I would have assumed that we had a plan for those funds of what we, what we oh. needed as far as engines okay. and trucks and... Uh, I got gotcha. you. Okay, fortunately we took in a little bit more revenue than we had anticipated because when we had the first year of increasing to the 100 per resident and what have you, it's based on an estimate, okay? Our estimate actually came in a lot higher. We got about 500,000, I, I don't remember, higher. We were allowed to bring over additional funds from the prior year, plus the additional 500 to 600 we were gonna get. That made up for the nine firefighters because the carry forward was significant enough. So now the estimates for 21 are matching what we got for 20. So we didn't budget all the way. We got more revenue we anticipated, so we have more carry forward. And that's how we were able to do that. Okay, Madam President. 
Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I think my, my questions pertain more to staff, and I kind of want to take this back in time because we're talking about a fee that was implemented far before there was a pandemic. So if I take myself back to those places where I, I voted on both of the increases subsequent to the original fire fee, and when we had those conversations, the conversation that stands out in my mind was for, for capital um, additions and to provide an increased level above what we were already funding. So that's kind of the, the level set that I take in my mind. I understand and remember a time on this dais where um, we did have a discussion that there would be the opportunity to have operational fees and, and H in the uses under uh, the fire assessment fee 4141-8 says salaries, volunteer pay, and other benefits. So I get that we're well established, this can go operational. So. Um, in the example that Administrator Johnson gave for the nine firefighters and the one truck that was put back into service, I distinctly remember when we took that vote, that was part of what was proposed as what was the incremental increase that was needed to justify the increase in fee. That was one part of it. And so I, I think part of what I struggle with, and I know Administrator Johnson, this predates your time here, so you're, you're looking back in history. but. From what I can recall, that was always supposed to be a part of the fire assessment fee. So I just want to make that point of clarification. I don't know that there's any way to clarify that today, but I think, you know, from what I'm hearing, we're, we're using that as the example of taking something from our, our general fund budget and taking it over to fire assessment fee. In my recollection, it was always supposed to be a part of fire assessment fee, and, and that recollection could be wrong. If, if I could just ask a point of clarification, when you say that was always supposed to be a part of it, are you saying that the staffing of the nine firefighters at the time that it was presented that it was supposed to be part of it? Correct. I remember asking the question on this dais because part of what the discussion was around approving that, that increase to the fire assessment fee was what are the incremental needs? And the incremental needs were to put another engine back in service and to have the nine firefighters to staff that engine. And that was part of the approval that I can recall in approving the second increase to the fire assessment fee. Okay, thank you. And, and that may very well have been, I can't speak you know, factually to uh, what that presentation was, but from a budget standpoint, it was not, the nine firefighters was not were not budgeted in either the general fund or on the fire assessment uh, fund side of the ledger. Therein, the staffing for that additional engine was done through overtime. In this year's budget, the nine firefighters are in the budget. So I can't speak in terms from a budget standpoint why it didn't make it into the budget on either side, and I'll turn it over to the budget manager. Okay. Um, at that time, before Ms. Johnson, uh, Mr. Green was here, on our presentation, the budget department was not aware that he was making the presentation for the nine firefighters. Financing allows us to make these shifts, okay? Um, the budget was already done, okay? So the budget for the fire assessment fee, the revenue was the same. We can, use, we can change around our purposes, okay? But what you approved for nine, the budget department was never given that information and the budget was already done and balanced pretty much. So that's why all of these changes and they were, they were added because Mr. Green said to add nine, so they were done on overtime. And that's where we are now going back to re, you know, make it right. You know, we, we made it right now. Okay. So you are correct. Your memory is right. absolutely. <laughs> I don't always get it 100%, but I just You're wanted correct. to clarify because that, that really stuck out to me, You're remembering uh, what, what the intent was. And Mayor, if I may um, yes. follow up. As we're looking again back in time on the first iteration of increasing the fire fee, we were looking at um, funding specifically stations four and eight. And during that time, stations four and eight were, were already under construction. They had already been approved, and to be very clear, I, I support the construction of, of those fire stations, very happy that they're up and running and in service, and I think really important to our citizens. But before that first increase in the fire assessment fee, we would have had some sort of 
debt payment plan for those fire stations that was not funded out of the fire assessment fee because it didn't exist. Correct? So there would have been some sort of debt service plan. Yes. And so when we approved that increase to the fire assessment fee, how did that change? Did we do away with that plan? Um, you know, again, in my mind, the level set was we were at a place where we had a level of service from the fire department. The intent behind increasing the fire assessment fee was to increase that level of service. So if we already had a debt service plan for those fire stations, would we not have stuck with that debt service plan? What was the strategy behind shifting them over to the fire assessment fee? And, you know, I'm just trying to understand where we would have done that. I understand now we're in a budget crunch and everyone tries to make numbers balance, but we're talking about a debt service plan, not money out of general funds, but there would have been some sort of bond, et cetera. Did we do away with that bond and shift the funds over to the fire assessment fee? How is that handled? I don't know if Mark is still here, but uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Mayor, Commissioners. Good morning. As it relates to the financing of the fire stations that you are speaking of, that also predates me. So what in, what in essence happened is that a line of credit was extended to build the fire stations. The line of credit was a two-year line of credit. By the time I had got here, I think this started in like 2008. So by the time I got here, it had been extended several times. That line eventually was canceled because they could not extend it anymore. So the, the setup for that and why a line of credit was used, I can't imagine, but there was no instrument in place to further finance those fire stations once that line canceled. So we did eventually go out and get more bond funding that the debt service was paid for through the fire assessment fee. Had we continued to take those lines of credit, that also would have been paid for out of the fire assessment fee. But at that point, it was just a line that was sitting there to be used that was never used. We were paying significant amounts of money just to keep it open. And it got to the point where the bank just would not do that anymore. So we canceled that line. We actually got a better situation. We borrowed money and we paid for the fire station. So it went from line of credit into bond funds and then from bond funds into fire assessment fee. Well, the bonds, the debt service is paid for by the fire assessment fee. And that, that, was, that should have always been the plan because most of the large capital improvements that we've done recently and leases have come from fire assessment if they are for fire suppression. So prior to the fire assessment fee um, funding the bond payments, where were the bond payments made from? Which account? I'm sorry, repeat that. So we are now using the fire assessment fee to service the bonds which paid for the fire stations. Mm -hmm. So yeah. prior to using fire assessment dollars, what dollars were you using? There was debt service coming from a fire assessment fee, but at that point, the bonds had not been issued. So by the time um, the bonds had been issued, all of the debt service was coming from the fire assessment fee. As had we used that line of credit, that's where that money would have come from as well to pay for that debt service. Sure. Um, and just one final, if I may, Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Um, you know, looking at, at where, where we're shifting funds around to, I guess, the, the one thing, and I think the poignant question that we find ourselves in now, we're looking at several different uses for fire assessment fee. At one point, we had a, a $4.7 million carry forward. I think I'd just like to have some clarity around the fact that we're looking at, at several different uses. At one point, we were told it was capital use only. Now we're told it can be used for salaries. 
Can fire assessment dollars be used to fund market adjustments? Can fire assessment dollars be used to fund increases in salary, et cetera, if that was part of the strategic goal of the fire assessment fee? Okay, so we have the uh, city attorney here, but my, my understanding of fire assessment fee is it's somewhat broad in the fact that it can cover basically anything related to fire suppression. It cannot cover uh, the emergency, um, the emergency response and medical costs, but it can cover most costs associated with fire suppression. And if you look at the document on page three, it kind of covers all of the items that can be covered in the fire assessment fee. Madam City Attorney, can you weigh in on that question, please? Absolutely. I, I think, as, as you can see, in 2008, when, when the ordinance was adopted, it was adopted to be able to cover and to list and to give you some examples of things that are available for payment from it. It's not intended to limit in any way. The only limit, and it's a limit that's created by law, is that you can't use these fees for the um, medical provision side of services from fire, but any fire assessment or fire suppression related fees are appropriate for expenditure under the funds. You have to just be willing to continue, though, um, to Im Im impose that same assessment. And if I can go back a little bit and, and help with what Mark was describing to you, when every time you issue a bond, in those bond dollars, there are Set the, the revenue streams are identified how you pay the bondholders back. So when that bond was created, the fire assessment fee is what secures payment of those bonds back to those um, persons who hold bond certificates. So that's how they get paid back. You clearly couldn't um, spend those dollars then have to be set aside for that purpose. So you couldn't uh, pay for things that would in anywhere in your in any way interfere with the repayment of the bond obligations from those assessments. And I think, as Mr. Park said, prior to the issuance of the bond, it was a line of credit. Right. And the uh, debt service in the line of credit came out of a operate, general operating fund, right? Well, the, the line of credit was never used for the fire station, so the payments that we were making were basically interest payments just to have that money available. Okay, and that came out of where? Uh, that came out of the general fund. I not the general, not the fire assessment fund, right? Right. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Um, we, we got some other uh, questions, I think. Did we finish your question? Uh, okay, got to you. Okay, Commissioner Fox. Thank you, I just have one final question. I. I had seen in one of the slides, it looked like there was a $3 million of reserves for the fire assessment fund. And so I just wanted to clarify, based on the conversation we just had and what I just heard, that, for example, the $3 million in those reserves could theoretically be used to negotiate a contract going forward for, for the fire department. Okay, are you talking about where it says transfer to debt fund? There or? was another page that okay. said something, of, it was about $3 million, I believe, in reserves. Do you have the slide that shows how much you have in reserves? Because there is, there is a difference between what's in reserves and then what's transferred to other funds. The reserves would be money that is available to fund. Okay. A, an assortment of other other things. So the commissioner is asking about reserves, not transfers, in and out. So at the bottom of that page, it says oh, reserve okay. for future projects. The two point nine. Okay, which year is this? Okay, in twenty twenty, we had two point nine. Uh, I have to look. Future projects. I'm going to have to get back to you on that list, to be quite honest with you. Well, let, let me, let me, let me uh, okay. elaborate on that question. I want to go to the city attorney, because uh, I think it was raised by uh, Madam President. Generally, can 
monies in the fire assessment fee be used to pay for, uh, I think she used the term, market adjustment. So it would be salaries and benefits mm -hmm. um, uh, to uh, firefighters to bring them up to uh, rankings, elevate their rankings uh, with, with respect to comparable fire departments. So generally, generally. conceptually. Can generally, yes, and purposes? generally it okay. is specifically stated that salaries and benefits are included in the enumerated lists of examples of things that could be paid from that assessment. Okay. Okay, so the 2.9, that was the end of 2020. So the 2.9 is brought forward and reallocated. So that money is reallocated, which would include uh, money for stations, training, um, capital leases, uh, gas, equipment maintenance, all of that, it's all blended in there. So that's carry forward because it was the ending balance at prior year. That ending balance comes forward and we're allowed to reappropriate it for all the various expenditures, which would include the nine firefighters as well. So when we took in revenue in prior year and prior year from that, as the projects are not complete or we may have appropriated money and not used it for whether it be maintenance or fuel or uniforms, it comes forward. So that's that bucket that comes forward and then it's reappropriated. So, so is that 2.9? Is that, uh, even though it says reserved for future projects, is that allocated? Yes. To specific yes. projects? Like those fire stations. So I think, Mayor, like you were saying, our next presentation, maybe we will do this just a little different to make it a little a lot clearer. Yes. <laughs> Ms. Ma Ms. McDermott, let me ask the question this way. Do you have a ballpark? I know we bring money forward and then we reallocate to help balance that fund for the ensuing budget year. But of the $7.7 .7 or $8 million for talking purposes that we have in the fire assessment fund, do you have a ballpark idea of how much of that is sitting on account as reserves that we're building toward a fund for whether it's future fire stations or the uh, proposed uh, training facility? I think that's really the right. funding that is in question. We really don't. We really appropriated everything out. That does not mean that we're going to use every penny, penny of that line item identified, uh, such as if we have 100,000 for the training facility, okay? We may or may <coughs> not use that within the year, depending on the way the project is going. That would then become, at the end of 21, it would drop down to that line like you're seeing. It would now become reserved for future project. You would reallocate that. So we did not identify a specific dollar amount is just sitting there for us to make a determination where that goes. Uh, that doesn't mean that you cannot transfer some budget based on the way projects are going or what commission's wishes are or fire station needs. We have found that we've had a lot of money in maintenance and until we get these extra fire trucks in, we put a lot more money in there, not knowing our expenses for the repairs could have leftover money or we may need more money for it. We do have a little bit of play in some of these, um, such as uh, Fire Station 9 additional funding. We, ha we have just a little bit of play, not a lot, but we didn't identify just a set aside reserve. But I know Ms. Johnson, we're talking about that with Fire Department, that is certainly the ideal and we hope to get there. And, and that's where, you know, coming up with a three to five year strategic plan devoted specifically to the fire assessment fee would be helpful uh, because uh, the policymakers could weigh in on how those dollars uh, would be spent over that period of time, uh, whether it's to continue to set aside monies uh, to pay for a new fire station or for maintenance or something like that, or uh, whether it, uh, these money should be used to pay for something else. Uh, let me ask a question. Uh, 
in the operating uh, budget, we have uh, a, a, a reserves, which are unallocated, uh, unallocated fund balance, we call it, correct? Yes, okay. the unassigned fund balance. Right. Do we have anything analogous where we have a pot of money that does not have a specific purpose uh, or purposes just sitting there in the fire assessment fee? Anything analogous to the unallocated fund balance in the fire assessment fee account? We do not right now. Uh, being that we are, they are, this is the second year collecting 7.7, .7, maybe 8 million. We do expect at the end of this year, if we can maintain expenses, fire truck expenditures don't go up, to now start having that. And that is the goal. I know that discussions with Ms. Johnson, that is our goal. When we have that leftover money, then you would look at it and say, you know, what do we want to do? Do you want to save this for another station? What, you know. Right. Okay. So that's the ideal. Are any other questions, Madam President? Thank you, Mayor. And, and I just want to say thank you to Staff Administrator Johnson and the Finance Department. I, I know it's not an easy thing to balance through, and, and Chief Maddie, for your work in working with the Finance Department. I think for me, uh, I'm, I go back to that initial spirit behind which I, I know I passed the increase in the fire assessment fee, and that was to provide incremental service to, uh, to our residents. And while we're looking at um, reserves for future projects, I think it deserves a, a robust discussion with both our fire department and um, administration, et cetera, because just in the same way we are building maintenance plans for this equipment that we're buying that's imperative to servicing our residents, I think we need to look at what is the maintenance of our personnel and our employees, because it may not be today that it breaks down, but if we do not plan, maintain, and service, it will break down in the future. And, and that is something that I think we, we need to take a keen look at. So if there is a way, again, I know we're shifting budget categories amongst um, the operational budget to fire assessment fee. I know our firefighters have worked really hard to get a $7 million grant. If there's a way to look at what's being paid for out of those fees and do some additional shifting to try to make sure that we accommodate service and maintain our labor force for the future is something that I'm certainly supportive of. So thank you. Any other questions, comments on this item? Uh, thank you all very much. It's a very detailed uh, presentation, very robust conversation. Appreciate it. We will ask you to come back um, uh, in a relatively uh, short time period, probably less than three months, just so we could continue this debate, conversation. Okay, um, let's move on now to item three, uh, update on homelessness services. Ms. Ferriol. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. You're gonna do this in less than half an hour, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you, no pressure. <laughs> Excellent, so again, good morning. Jennifer Ferriol, Director of Housing and Community Development. And I have here with me Marcus Laws. He is our Homeless Services Coordinator, and he will also be discussing some of the um, elements that we'll be discussing in our presentation. Again, I want to thank the Commission um, and the Mayor for giving us the opportunity to further discuss the City's efforts surrounding homelessness and our response to that issue. Um, so as you know, um, Housing and Community Development's Division of Community Services is known as the Vickers House, and that location, which is located on Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard, provides a one-stop location offering a variety of different support services. One of them, and one of the ones that we primarily focus on, is homeless outreach and advocacy. Um, Marcus will get into a little bit more detail in terms of what that entails, um, but we provide homeless outreach and advocacy. Housing placement, making sure that individuals who are in need of housing are placed. We have great relationships with numerous social service providers and with landlords who have the ability to assist us with um, uh, making sure that we find adequate um, housing for individuals. Case management and referrals. Um, while housing for the homeless is a, a, an issue in itself, one of the biggest concerns or things that we want to make sure that we're doing is to provide support services to those individuals. So whether that be, if needed, mental health services or substance abuse services, um, or making sure that they're referred um, to an outside organization um, to assist them with other needs, um, may, maybe even um, you know helping them get um, um, uh, 
IDs or, or connecting them to other things that they need just to have a you know, regular day-to-day -day, um, interactions. Obviously, mental health services, which I discussed. We assist individuals with resume development and job placement. So we have, again, connections with numerous providers who can assist us with um, finding employment. Obviously, that's a big um, aspect and, and something that we focus on. Tax services. Um, SNAP and Medicaid uh, partner site. Um, DCF actually comes on site to the Vickers House location and provides assistance to individuals to either uh, sign up for food stamps or for Medicaid. And we also work with the Department of Corrections um, for community service sites. So they do um, community service hours within our location. Um, we also help individuals um, who just exited the criminal justice system. Um, we help them with connecting them to services. Um, so what does our team look like? Um, currently in housing and community development, we have a total of seven full-time equivalents um, dedicated 100% either to homeless services or homeless prevention services. That team is managed by Lisa Kemp, who is our community resource manager, and she oversees all of the day-to-day -day operations out of the Vickers House. Marcus Laws, who is our homeless services coordinator, he pretty much is kind of that glue that brings everything together. He works with the different uh, uh, nonprofit, excuse me, nonprofit organizations. He works with um, the business community, with DDA, with just with the different type of, of, of providers out there to kind of bring it all together. Eric, Erica, and Cecilia, um, half of their time is allocated to actually doing on-street engagement. The other half is um, assisting individuals with uh, first and last month's rent, making sure that they have the proper case management that they need, and making sure that um, they're connected to other services. I will add that both Lisa and Marcus also conduct a lot of outreach as needed. Um, so I do want to add that they, they, they do that as well. And currently, we're in the process of hiring two homeless outreach specialists, which will be 100% um, dedicated to on-street services. Um, so that um, we're in the process of hiring two individuals to do that. Um, in support of that, um, we have a contract with Mental Health America, um, and they provide two mental health providers to our team, 100% dedicated to providing services within West Palm Beach. Um, I want to add that that is funded through Community Development Block Grant funds, so those are federal dollars. And the limitation with that is um, we're only allowed to utilize 15% of our annual allocation. So it's really only about $140,000 and $130,000 that we can use for these types of social services. Um, so we're limited in terms of what we can allocate um, for these kinds of contracts. And we have Shakela Hart. She is actually a licensed clinical social worker. Um, and she is able to provide um, mental health assessments. She can bake her act if needed. She can um, actually work with them on making sure that they get prescription meds, so that's a huge program that we're also working on. So we, we have a mental health professional on staff, and Jonathan Perez, he does additional outreach, housing placement. So when you total um, all of the, the, the FTEs, we have about nine FTEs, and also with the support of Jeremy Morse, who is the CEO of Mental Health America. I want to kind of touch on this picture here, and you will see um, it kind of adds to the partnerships that we have with the police department. There was a call um, that police was called um, due to it to um, someone called indicating there was a, an issue with a homeless person and he called our um, homeless um, outreach team and we connected him with a licensed mental health professional and they both went out there to respond to the um, to the call which I think is a, a program that I would love to if we had resources in the future to further expand so that our police officers can have a mental health professional um, go out with them when they're responding to these calls. And with that said, um, I'm going to introduce Marcus, who is going to just get into a little bit more detail on the outreach and the housing and how those um, programs are spearheaded. Good morning, Mayor, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, so our homeless outreach team uh, is dedicated to uh, providing on-street access to services for those who are experiencing homelessness. Our purpose is to identify, engage, and assess individuals who are in need, uh, refer to those individuals, and make sure that they maintain uh, their engagement, which uh, comes to the point where we have to visit them on a weekly basis and make sure that uh, they're following through on any other paperwork that may be needed or any duties that we may have to follow through up uh, in regards to their case. 
Um, we also document our contacts and collect documentation that's needed in order to further their housing placement. Uh, here you'll see uh, our current schedule for our outreach uh, in the community. Um, we have made adjustments uh, due to feedback from the community as well as our own observations. Um, so we are going out uh, early in the morning time starting at 7.30 and stagnating our time uh, to allow us to go out in the evening as well. Uh, we'll continue to work towards uh, making sure this schedule can be as effective as possible in order to meet the needs of the community. Um, and we always welcome feedback. Um, we currently do have uh, CJE Security who is uh, in the parks. Uh, in West Palm Beach and what they do is they are allowed to go in, uh, assess safety measures, make sure that uh, there's no drugs or uh, nefarious activity going on. They report to the police department if that, if that happens. If they do come in contact with homeless individuals, they do report that uh, to myself and to Lisa. Um, and we take part to uh, make sure that we follow up on those reports that we get from CJA security. As part of our strategies um, for street outreach and engagement, we have begun collaborations um, with the county's hot team, uh, as well as our partnership with Mental Health America, and we also continue to partner with the Lord's Place as well. Uh, we have weekly case conferencing and uh, strategic planning meetings to assess what uh, is happening on the streets, how we can be more effective, and how we communicate the needs of those we are serving. Um, our combined utilization of re resource allocation allows us to look at the dollars we have available within our social service programs, as well as programs that are being provided by the county and other agencies who provide homeless services. And we seek to make sure that we're using our money as effectively. So if we're not able to uh, support one uh, individual through our programs, we do reach out to the county and other agencies uh, for their utilization of funds. Um, we've increased our collaboration of case management and data tracking, again, with our week, uh, weekly case conferencing. Um, this allows us to actually share what's happening on cases in real time and to come up with common solutions. Um, through those uh, efforts, we're trying to establish uniform engagement practices to ensure that everyone is doing the same thing at the same time. That increases our communication. Uh, it limits the possibility for bottlenecking in our system, and it also improves our ability to serve those who are experiencing homelessness. Um, we've also uh, begun marketing and community education efforts. I've met with a few of our neighborhood associations to get their feedback on how they uh, view homeless circumstances in their neighborhoods to be able to provide a, a, a tempered response. Um, and we look to uh, increase those collaborations over the future. We'll be having our marketing uh, rollout uh, next couple of months yes. in the next couple of months we all have our marketing rollout um, part of these strategies also include the utilization of the Baker Act for those with mental health and behavioral health concerns and the Marchman Act to address those who have chronic substance use concerns um, we are looking to help increase income through employment and education opportunities and uh, our newly implemented homeless activity reporter has quickly become a, a tool that allows us to see what is happening in the community and to respond effectively. So the activity reporter is a web-based tool. Um, it allows users, um, whether it be a community member or someone ex experiencing homelessness, to send in their information or uh, report information to us and we're able to work with our partners at Mental Health America as well as with the county to make sure that these issues are addressed in a timely fashion. Um, we respond to these reports within 24 hours. If there's a phone number or email address that's available, we do reach out to the community who's making those reports. Um, this is an example of our coordinated entry system, and this coordinated entry system is a best practice um, as given by the National Alliance of Ending Homelessness. Um, what it allows is for us to uh, use our street outreach team as we find individuals who are experiencing homelessness. We are able to gather their information and to make referrals um, while we're accepting and prioritizing them based on the critical needs that they have. This feeds into our acuity list, which is a uh, list of people that we uh, have engaged with throughout the city and throughout the county who are experiencing homelessness uh, in a chronic sense meaning they've been uh, homeless for one continuous year or multiple episodes of homelessness over a period of three years. 
Um, this acuity list allows us to decipher whether or not um, we're able to help with their case and what that looks like and what supportive service is going to be most effective for those individuals. Part of those uh, housing program solutions that come out of our coordinated entry is permanent supportive housing, uh, which is targeted towards chronically homeless individuals to allow them to move into housing with low barriers. And then we introduce services to them prior or after uh, they've been housed. So the priority is to make sure they're housed first and off the street, and that is part of their care plan. Our rental assistance program is continuous. It allows us to identify individuals who have uh, difficulty maintaining employment or maintaining housing stability due to uh, inability to maintain their funds. Uh, that rental assistance is provided to them on a measured basis and it's dependent on their income and their ability to maintain engagement with case management. Our eviction prevention program allows us to uh, look at individuals who are facing eviction or three-day notice um, and to implement funding that is able to keep them sta into stable housing. We have housing opportunities for persons with AIDS, uh, rapid rehousing, which is targeted towards uh, individuals who have recently become homeless. And we suspect that through, uh, through a quick means of uh, allowing some funding to support them, they're able to quickly get on their feet and maintain employment and maintain housing after that with limited interaction from uh, continued service venues. Um, we also have uh, mainstream HUD vouchers and HUD bash vouchers. Our HUD bash vouchers are specifically targeted towards um, our veterans who are experiencing homelessness within the county. Uh, when we look at our strategic partnerships, because we can't do it all by ourselves, uh, we have adopt a family who is the entry point for families experiencing homeless, homelessness. We have CJE security, uh, which is geared for sub, uh, safety in city parks and service coordination. We have our community partnerships, uh, which is our shop program and our mental health services. Uh, that has run my community partners, and they, uh, again, are someone who uh, focuses on mental health and housing those with mental health and behavioral issues. Um, Gulfstream Goodwill Industries is a major player for us. They are the homeless resource center for the county. Um, they are a point of coordinated entry. They conduct supportive housing, and then they allow us to be able to shelter those who are in need of emergency shelter. Our Legal Aid Society provides access to legal services. We have the Lord's Place for Homeless Resources, Mental Health America for street, street Engagement, access to mental and physical health services and medication. Our Palm Beach County Hot Team that provides community services and coordination of services. PSC Security for Downtown Safety in Northwood and Entertainment Districts. St. Anne Place, uh, who is also an interest St. Anne's Place is also an entry point for those experiencing homelessness. Um, they connect with us on a regular basis and provide feedback to us on uh, the growth that we are seeing in the homeless population or the decline that we're seeing. And then they provide strategic partnerships when it comes to different funding. Um, I, yes, um, Jennifer also wanted me to mention how essential St. Anne's Place has been with us as a uh, new and continuing partner. Um, historically, St. Anne's Place has uh, been off to the side. Um, they've had their own stream of funding and they've not generally participated um, in a lot of activities that have gone on with the continuum of care. As of this recent year, um, they have begun to participate more heavily uh, within the continuum of care. They now have access to our uh, continuum's uh, Healthcare system, which is called Client Track, where we uh, use it for data management and project management. Uh, they are entering that data on a regular basis, and they are working with the Vigors House and Mental Health America on a regular basis to produce services for those experiencing homelessness. Um, our Veterans Administration. Hold on. Uh, uh, Madam President has a question at this point. Yes. Thank you. Uh, pardon the interruption. Just while we're on the subject of, of St. Anne's Place. Um, throughout the North End, we've, we've had um, a challenging relationship sometimes mm -hmm. back and forth with St. Anne's Place as they try to address this continually growing issue. There are things that, that bleed into the neighborhoods that um, kind of encroach on private property along the residents of 20th Street. And I know um, Housing Community Development has worked closely to try to address those issues, but it is an ongoing um, problem for the neighborhoods. So could you talk a little bit about maybe this new formed relationship and how 
Um, we're, we're working together with the St. Anne's Place to try to address the issues that spill over into our neighborhoods. Sure. Um, as you would notice over the last couple of months, there's been a decrease in terms of the individuals who are, um, again, you know, uh, kind of the overspill that we see after hours. And St. Anne has really done a great job at, you know, quite frankly, say, look, you can't, you know, after hours, you just got to make sure that you can't sleep here. They've been really essential and sometimes even denying services in the event that they saw anybody who was not really, you know, acting uh, accordingly or people that were, you know, um, doing specific activities on other properties. So they've been really helpful with that. Um, I'll, I'll say it, it is a difficult task because they are an organization who's trying to help out homeless individuals. And when that organization, wherever they're located, you're going to attract the individuals to that location. But they're very, they're extremely helpful and they understand, you know, the issues of the community and the surrounding community. And again, they have denied services to individuals who have uh, you know, engage in activities that they shouldn't be engaging in. So they, they, they're, they're a huge partner. And I'll say this, we are the only organization that is allowed on their site. Um, the city of West Palm Beach and the Vickers House, we're the only ones who can actually go on site and provide services and help them um, with their uh, with their processes. Sure, and, and thank you for that. And I know it's a complicated issue and certainly, you know, St. Anne's is really trying to provide some very much needed services. Um, you know, I think it comes down to that balance of, of neighborhood needs. You know, we have members of the public that are in here quite frequently with, with the same issues. And so uh, not, not casting blame on everyone and understanding that it's a, it's a complicated issue. Have we ever um, approached St. Anne's about maybe helping to find them a location that's uh, further away from residential neighborhoods so that we can make sure that we address the issues but, but limit the problems that are, are encroaching on private residences around the area? We have. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that that's something that they're open to at the moment, um, but we have tried that approach in the past. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Uh, please continue. Mm -hmm. and, and I would just add uh, to the point on saying is they have uh, implemented security cameras to uh, kind of catch the video of folks who are causing some adverse activities in that neighborhood, and they have been working closely with the neighbors and the businesses around there to try and mitigate some of those issues. Um, but to continue, um, we, we also have uh, Vita Nova as a strategic partner uh, who provides housing and community services for youth ages 18 to 24. Our Parks and Recreation Department uh, provides safety and community events in our, in our city parks. Our West Palm Beach Police Department provides safety, law enforcement, connection to community services. Our West Palm Beach Sanitation Department provides community cleanliness response. And a partner who is not listed but has been awesome is uh, the Downtown Development Association. Um, with all of these partnerships, um, for those who can participate, we have begun weekly meetings um, to ensure that we have open communication about how homelessness is affecting our agency and our departments at each end and how we can work more, collaborati more collaboratively together in order to address these issues for the city. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Lambert has a question. Just wanted to clarify what you said, Marcus. Thank you. Did you say that you have weekly meetings with these strategic partners? Yes, ma'am. Uh, mi minus a few, we do have a strategic partnership with uh, the Sanitation Department, the Parks Department, St. Anne Place, Mental Health America, Gulfstream Goodwill. And what's the intent of, of those weekly meetings? Um, the, t the intent of the weekly meetings is for us to increase communication and collaboration. Uh, we've noticed that communication is one thing that always affects whether or not we're able to uh, be effective in our roles. So our goal is to make sure that we, um, we know what we're doing on the street. So if we have services that we can provide, we share those services with those who uh, attend this meeting as well as good Gulfstream Goodwill. If we need additional help from sanitation in a particular area, we want, to, want them to be notified. So the goal is that we increase our communication and we become more effective in what we do. Great, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. And of course, I, I wanna highlight some of the accomplishments as a result of the efforts that have been ongoing over the last year. Um, 363 individuals were serviced through the street engagement team, either through the city or the Lord's Place. Um, I wanna add before I continue that we've been really careful with data. One of the things that we wanna make sure is that we're providing accurate data um, and that we have source documentation for all of this. So um, providing accurate data is something that we're, we're highly focusing on. Um, 133 individuals received mental health services um, with Mental Health America. 
68 individuals were reconnected to a loved one through the city's Homeward Bound program. This is a program where we assist um, individuals um, to relocate um, to a, a loved one back home or in another location. We try to be very responsible with the program where we will not send someone to another location unless there is a uh, someone who can accept them or take them in. So we verify that before we uh, pay for someone to, to relocate. Um, 10 individuals, I'm sorry, 61 individuals were placed into emergency shelter or housing. Um, a lot of these numbers are a little bit low because of COVID, um, but we'll talk a little bit more about our response related to that. Um, 10 homeless individuals were provided job readiness skills and training and were able to seek and gain employment. And 188 responses um, were provided to residents who had used our new homeless activity reporter app. Obviously, COVID threw a huge uh, wrench for all of us. And you know, while we were still able to maintain a certain level of services, none of our programs or our initiatives ever stopped. Not only that, but we also then had to create new programs and new partnerships and, and you know, uh, work with different organizations to be able to respond to COVID. So we were one of those departments who was really involved in working with the county to um, process applications for food voucher assistance. So 2,300 households in West Palm Beach received food vouchers. Um, 1,400 um, received utility payments. Um, 1,300 um, individuals received rental assistance or eviction prevention. 300 households received assistance with their mortgage. Um, we were also assisting individuals to apply for food stamps and unemployment on site. If you don't recall, there was a time where it was really difficult to utilize the unemployment and for individuals to sign up. So we um, put together a program where we were helping individuals to do that. And this was all with our existing staff. Our existing staff was either doing outreach or they were in the office processing applications to support our residents with these efforts. Um, I will leave this, Mayor, because I wanna, I wanna promise you to be done in less than 30 minutes. I had a video that I wanted to share, but I can email that to all of you. Um, and that concludes our presentation. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to further assist. Well, well let me make a comment, and, and thank you for that very uh, in-depth presentation. Um, and thank you, uh, Ms. Freo, for you and your department for really addressing uh, the homeless situation in a comprehensive uh, manner. You know, it just irks me that uh, we as a city, we as a legislative body, will come under attack uh, from those who have read a proposal uh, to suggest that we as a city are insensitive uh, to the plight of the homeless uh, and that we're criminalizing homelessness. Nothing could be further from the truth, and I tell you what, I will hold up uh, the efforts as described here uh, by uh, your department in the city of West Palm Beach against any uh, other municipality uh, in this county uh, and maybe even beyond in terms of what we are doing to address the homeless situation. Listen, it's not a West Palm Beach problem. It is not a Palm Beach County problem. This is a national problem. Uh, and, and we're doing what we can, but there is a balance that has to be struck uh, between a quality of life that our citizens deserve uh, and uh, what we are doing in this area. And I think we're striking that balance uh, very well. Now listen, there's more work to be done, uh, but we also as a city are, are, are getting a number of uh, affordable uh, and workforce units uh, there uh, out. Uh, you know, the, 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 the cure to homelessness is obviously putting everyone in homes. And so we're working on providing transitional housing. But again, I will hold up our efforts uh, as described here, against any other municipality. And I, I dare anyone uh, to come and, 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 and criticize us uh, as a city uh, because we are not doing uh, anything for the homelessness. That is uh, an absolute uh, despicable mischaracterization characterization of the truth. I could have said something else, but anyway. So thank you again uh, for your efforts, and I appreciate this presentation. And commissioners, any Questions? Uh, yes, Commissioner Lambert. Thank you so much for the presentation and thank you to your team for the outreach that you're doing. I know that um, I have used the app. I have had residents use the app and tell me about it and you all have always been very responsive. 
not only in reaching out to them, but then following up with us to let us know the results. And I just want to say thank you for that. Um, I also heard a story um, from the Mental Health Association that they had an individual who's who came in with their spouse and made the very hard decision that the one needed to be Baker acted. Mm -hmm. And when they called for the police to assist in that process, as is the policy and procedure, um, it was reported that the police handled it with much care and the delicacy that's the delicate nature that's needed um, in handling those situations. So I do think that the training is working and, mm -hmm. and those partnerships are working. So thank you for that. I was wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about um, our the contract that we used to have with the Lord's Place and we that we no longer have because I know we heard that um, mentioned recently in some of the um, comments from the public and, and I, I certainly respect and see all of the outreach that we're doing internally now as a city but can you talk a little bit about why we're we're not in contract with the Lord's Place specifically? Well, I have to be honest, it was a very difficult decision to make and it was a very difficult budget process for us. And you know, housing and community development, I wanna say over 90% of our budget is staff, right? Our general fund budget, let me, let me clarify. Our general fund budget is used to cover staff. So when budget cuts and considerations needed to be looked at, the only other general fund contract that we had was a contract um, with this organization that was, you know, in X, Y dollar amounts, right? And so this was the most cost-effective way for us to make sure that our staff wasn't laid off. We didn't want to lay off our, our team. And because of, you know, the tight budget considerations that we had to make, it was either looking at ways to get creative internally or lay off some of our staff just to keep the contract. So that's really kind of what, you know, what we looked at and how we try to measure the whole situation. And I can appreciate that we want to keep our staff on, but I think we also want to make sure we're providing the best services. So, you know, I, I heard you talk a lot about all of the outreach strategies and all of the partners that we're utilizing, and the Lord's Place was still listed among Absolutely. those, I believe. So can you speak to that a little bit more about how are we ensuring that we're staying up to date with the most current practices that you know, an organization that that is their sole mission is to focus on that. How are we an organization that has a hundred different priorities able to make sure that we're still providing the highest level service possible? Well, you know, I have always believed that partnerships are more than just, you know, a, a, a a situation where we provide funding. You can still partner with any organization in different ways, right? And still, um, you know, have them at the table. They're still at the table. We still communicate with them on a, you know, daily, weekly basis. Um, we work with all the other organizations that we've outlined. You know, we have staff who has been, this is their bread and butter. We have actually staff who was hired or was at the Lord's Place at some point. Um, you know, we have internal expertise that we're utilizing for these services. And again, the Lord's Place is still, uh, uh, they're a partner to us. The county's a partner, um, Gulfstream Goodwill, St. Anne. I can't tell you one homeless service organization that we're not a partner of when we're actually leaders at the table. As the mayor stated, we're the only municipality other than the county that has this level of response to homelessness. The only other that I could think of has one FTE and that's in the police department that assists with homelessness. So other than the county, we really are the only ones providing these services. And I will stand here and tell you that the team that we just outlined, they are just as qualified and up to date on providing these services than anybody else. Um, and, I, and I stand behind that. And again, the Lord's Place will always continue to be a partner and, and we will always continue to look for ways in which we can um, you know, fund them in future uh, uh, circumstances or look for housing opportunities to work with them on. So I, I wanna clarify that. I mean, they're a partner to us and unfortunately we're just in a trying time where it was either our staff or, or another or something else. So well, Jennifer, you, you, Ms. Ferriero, you're being very, very diplomatic and I, I certainly appreciate that. Uh, I am confident, uh, Commissioner, uh, that we will be able to provide these services at or in excess of the level uh, that was previously provided. Uh, that's the kind of confidence I have uh, that the team we put together uh, can do this job uh, and do it very, very well. 
uh, you know, the Lord's place uh, is not uh, the exclusive uh, expert when it comes to how to interact uh, with the homeless. Uh, and, and listen, we have in uh, Marcus a homeless outreach coordinator. That is his job. That's not his that's not an ancillary thing. That is his job. And, and so he is tasked with understanding what best practices are. So I am quite confident uh, under Ms. Ferriero's leadership, uh, Marcus' leadership, that we will be able to provide the same services uh, at uh, or in excess of the quality uh, that we were getting from the Lord's Place. And if you're looking at uh, uh, city government, you want the biggest bang for your buck. And we made the decision internally that we could do this job, and we could do it very effectively uh, for a, a lower cost. Thank I you. will say that. You can't say that. I will say that. Thank you, Mayor. I do have some other yes, follow-up. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you mentioned in the stats, and thank you so much for letting us know how careful you are with those statistics. You mentioned 61 individuals placed in emergency housing. Can you talk a little bit about what our emergency housing options look like? Sure. I'll have Marcus answer that question. Okay. Um, so for emergency housing options, um, we, we look at a variety of things. Um, Palm Beach County has no true emergency housing, uh, to be uh, frank and honest. The way our emergency housing comes about is through our coordinated entry process where we identify those who are most in need. Um, we utilize the uh, Lewis Center as well as the annex and uh, new facility that is uh, being uh, built out in uh, Bell Glade and Pahokee area. Um, those are our points for uh, emergency housing, and it is based on um, the level of need, vulnerability that a person has on a case-by-case, -case, and then the availability of the beds that the Lewis Center has. I believe um, they are able to house about uh, 65 at the Lewis Center at a given time, and then at the annex, it's around 125. Thank you. And, and just so I'm clear that we're using the same definition, an emergency housing situation would be someone, a city staff or a police officer comes across someone who's homeless, who's mm -hmm. sleeping in a place, you know, that they shouldn't be, and they are able to place them in emergency housing that evening? Uh, yes. Yes, the police, can, the police can do a drop off to the Lewis Center and that person can be placed that evening. Um, and then as far as uh, additional emergency housing, um, we would be looking at uh, motel and hotel vouchers that are provided on case by case and by various agencies. And, and so the motel, hotel option vouchers, we partner with other agencies that have that ability. And so we work with them to provide housing, you know, within hours of coming upon an individual who would need this. Yes, ma'am. And, and I also want to add, um, there are some other alternatives that we're also exploring. Um, we have some exciting things that I don't really want to give away, but we're looking at some other th uh, things that we can utilize for overnight shelter. Again, we have used hotels or motels to shelter individuals. We have also, um, uh, Mayor, part of your 303, we have uh, Alice, Dr. Alice Moore. Um, who is a supportive housing project. We also had Home at Tamron, another supportive housing project. And we're actually looking at a, uh, there's a project in which we were able to make that connection. Uh, there's a site on Tamron that was just redeveloped. It's 20 units of housing, but can actually house 36 individuals. And South Florida Behavioral Health Network, MHA, and um, um, uh, neighborhood, uh, no, the partners, neighborhood. Community partners, I'm sorry. Um, they are actually taking over that space and we're gonna be able to do emergency housing and transitional housing on those sites as well. So that we're gonna do a ribbon cutting for that mayor um, in the next couple of weeks. So there's a lot of supportive housing and it's not just a matter of, when we're talking about the chronically homeless, it's not just finding housing. It is giving them the support services that they need and they're going to need a lot of that because when you're looking at those who have been on the streets for extensive periods of time, there's oftentimes an underlying condition which is either a mental health or a substance abuse issue and you need to be able to give someone those services before they can you know, really go off on their own if, if they ever go off on their own. So um, we're prioritizing that as well. Do you have a follow-up, Commissioner? Just to say thank you so much. Um, not only, you know, thank you for doing the work, thank you for educating us on this, but thank you for educating 
educating the community on this because I know anybody who I've put you in touch with who, you know, to the mayor's comments before are saying, you know, we're not doing enough. You've always taken the time to meet with them, to give them a tour, and, and I really appreciate that because I think half the battle is the communication and education of, of the services we provide. Sure. Thank you. Uh, real quick, uh, Jennifer, what is the latest uh, count? I know every year we do a, uh, what do they call it, a point in time uh, mm -hmm. uh, count on homelessness in our streets. Have we done one recently? What was the most That is of yet. No, All yet, right, sir. Pr probably because of hope. The other thing I do want to point out is uh, presumably the services that we were, you were providing uh, in this area continued during COVID, right? You, yes. you didn't like uh, go home and shut the shut the uh, put up the clothes for business sign right? no sir thank you i mean and, and again the, these are people who are on the front line uh, uh we we often hear about uh you know our, our first responders and we certainly appreciate everything that they're doing but uh the point i'm trying to make is we have other city employees who are also on the front line who continue to do their job during this pandemic and, and i don't think enough of that gets uh, publicize and I'm doing what I can so thank you thank, thank you, you thank you for even in the midst of a pandemic continuing to provide these services uh, to our homeless neighbors okay anything else uh, I, I don't have anything under mayor's matters uh, thank you all thank very you. much and uh, this is, I think it's been a very good meeting thank you thank you thank you all